So if you have your Bibles or your apps or however you are following along with us, I would like to ask you to stand and we're going to read a section of scripture out of John chapter 9, verse 12, beginning at verse 1. Pay close attention as the story unfolds to unique kinds of things. This is one of my favorite stories. I laugh as I read this because of the dialogue. It's funny. And so I may do some dialogue funny stuff in here for you to kind of show you what it, how it makes me laugh. Now Jesus passed by. He saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind. And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me. While it is day, the night is coming, and no one can work. And as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go and wash in the pool of Salam, which is translated scent. And so he went and he washed, and he came back seeing. And therefore the neighbors of those who previously had seen the blind man said, Is this he? who sat and begged, and some said, this is he, and others said, he is like him, and he said, I am he, <laughs> and therefore they said to him, how were your eyes opened? And he answered and said, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And so I went and washed and I received my sight. And then they said to him, where is he? And he said, I don't know. Do you believe in miracles this morning? Do you personally believe in miracles? Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We are a miracle. Yes, we are. And we're asking God that you would open eyes of our understanding to the deep truths of your word, that we might be transformed by the working of your Holy Spirit with the word of God in us, that this is not words that are the letter of the law, but of the spirit that brings life and transformation that we might, our eyes might be opened as this blind man's eyes were opened, that spiritually we can see what you want us to see. And Father, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Since it's Love Somebody Sunday, give somebody a hug nearby there. Tell them you love them. You're glad they're here. I believe in miracles. I am one. Uh, from the time that I was very young, there's a miraculous stories. Uh, my, my parents thought I was going to perish early as, a, as an infant. Uh, they, they, they discovered uh, by trial and error that I was allergic to milk. And uh, I had gone into um, a, 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 a condition of not being able to breathe and had swollen face red and all of this kind of stuff. And, uh, as a result, almost lost me as a child. And um, so throughout my life, the miraculous, God has done miracles. I can remember in high school being severely injured. And, uh, you know, uh, they thought initially I might have broken a leg. And turns out that they believed that I had uh, seriously damaged ligaments in my knee and gone to specialists and all this kind of stuff. They had ran all the tests to drain the, the, the knee was big and they drained blood off of it and all kinds of stuff like this and said, you know, um, okay, you know, we're going to do surgery and we're putting you on crutches. You're not going to be able to walk until after surgery is done. Going home and sitting uh, down, actually it was my, uh, my aunts and uncles, we were in Phoenix. Uh, at the time we were living somewhere else and they, they lived in Phoenix and so we had to go to Phoenix for the specialist. And uh, sitting on my aunt and uncle's couch by myself and just saying, God, heal me. 
and I believe I can walk and standing up and beginning to take my first steps in over a month and uh, walk across the room and then going back to the doctor and saying, I don't know what's going on, but it looks like it's just a severe sprain and not, uh, you know, your ACL is not blown out. And so miracle after miracle after miracle in my own life, but I've also seen them as a minister and as a pastor in the lives of so many others. I was only about, uh, I don't know, probably five or six, maybe six or seven, six or seven at this point when uh, we went out to the ranch. I went with my dad. He was the pastor, and we had been called by this family. They said that uh, their daughter was, uh, they, they had a ranch there. Uh, she had been thrown from the horse into the fence and lay lifeless on, on the ground. And uh, I remember my dad being later sharing the story that he was fearful these people had not called the ambulance or 911. They called their pastor. And uh, so we're out here in the middle of nowhere. She's lifeless, breathless, been that way since before they called us and we came out. I'm standing back as, as, a, as a young six-year-old, seven-year-old, kind of peeking in at my friend and looking to see, you know, what's happened to her. And, uh, you know, as, as he begins to lay hands on her and pray that the breath of life comes back into her, that suddenly she starts coughing and, and breathing again and, and sets up and and uh, truly believe that, that I was a witness and have been at a couple of other times to a, a miraculous resurrection, a healing that is, is unbelievable. And throughout my life, seen all kinds of things that we could take all day just sharing the miraculous. I believe in miracles. Yes. I believe in them. I believe Jesus is a miracle worker. I've seen healings in people's lives, uh, you know, provisions, transformations. And, and maybe the greatest miracle of all, you know, is, is the life change that happens in people when Jesus gets a hold of their hearts and lives, isn't it? And I've known people, I've grown up with them. Uh, I remember a, a, a young lady named Patty, and uh, she, she's a beautiful, tall, six foot two, and a, a grade ahead of me in, in high school. And she was in a fight every single day. She had this, this, uh, she, this victim mentality. Everybody was out to get her. And if you just looked cross-eyed at her, Patty was, you know, she was constantly in the, in the principal's office and uh, constantly in trouble and suspended from school. We had a revival in our town. I invited Patty along with some of the other students from our church to come to this revival. And she gave her heart to Jesus Christ. I'll tell you, you could see it on her face. She became a different person, and, and people in, in school would, would like kind of, you know, when she walked down the hall, and, and, and she would just come over and hug them, and it was a totally different person. She wanted to launch a Bible club. We hadn't even thought about a Bible club, call the Christians, but the new Christian thought we needed a Bible club in school, and it was a total transformation, and I've seen that over and over again, how God can transform hearts and lives and make something new, but here's the deal. How is not a problem for God, is it? It's, it's a man problem. How is a man problem? It's not a God problem. How is something that paralyzes you and I from uh, asking for the miracle? How is what paralyzes you and I sometimes from believing for the miracle for someone else? You know, you, there's a sense of helplessness and hopelessness to certain situations. And, and we just, you know, we're just trying to think through our minds how. And it's just, oh, this is, this is impossible. And God always specializes in the impossible, doesn't he? And throughout the Bible, though, there are real stories of real people who, who, who couldn't get over how. And uh, when God told them there was going to be a miracle that happened, they, they had to ask how. They, they didn't know uh, how that was going to happen. You might remember early on in Exodus chapter 6, verse 12, and Moses spoke before the Lord when God had called him to go set the people free uh, out of Egyptian bondage. He said, you're going to be my leader. You're going to go speak to Pharaoh. And so uh, Moses had a how question, right? He say, he's saying, the, the children of Israel have not heeded me, how then shall Pharaoh heed me? The people you're asking me to lead aren't listening to me. If they won't listen, how do you expect a, a, a leader who doesn't even believe in you and who's ruling over this country and has, has no authority over his head, he's the king, he's in charge of everything, how do you think he's going to listen to me? And we know the story that he did listen and God turned his heart. 
Uh, in Judges chapter 6, there's a, there's a guy by the name of Gideon who God called to, to lead the armies of Israel uh, to victory and out from under the bondage that they were in. And, uh, and, and Gideon was, you know, called by God. He had no idea. He wasn't a, a great soldier, a great general. He was just a common person. And God called him and said he was going to use him. And, and so he had a question, a how question for God. In, in Judges chapter 6, verse 13, he says, So he said to him, O Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. How are you going to use me? Nobody even knows me. If they say, you know, hey, let's all go follow Gideon. It's like, Gideon who? Uh, nobody even knows me. How am I going to lead them and, and be the general over their lives? And of course, we know he became the general and the leader, but also a great judge in, in the book of Judges. Luke chapter 1, verse 18 uh, reminds us a story of, of Zacharias and how God had told him that his wife in her old age was going to have a, a child. They were going to have a child in, in, in their old age, and it was going to be John, and, and they were going to name his, his name John. And Zacharias, uh, when the angel told him Zacharias had a, a question, he said, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. How, God? And then we see it again when, when the angel appears to Mary and tells her, you know, that, that there's the, the Messiah is coming through you. You're going to call this child, you're pregnant, you're going to call this child Jesus. And she, How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? How is a man problem, but how is not a God problem? And when we are asking the how questions, we are struggling in faith to believe and to trust in God. And that's what we're saying to God. I'm, I'm struggling with this, God. And, and so I, I need to know the, how you're going to work this out. What are the details? What is the details of the miracle? How are you going to make this happen for me and for my family? And the, the interesting thing for those of us who are Christians and believers and followers of Jesus Christ, there may be some in this room who are not, who are more like fans of Jesus, and you're, you're listening, you're not quite, you haven't crossed the line yet, and you're still on kind of a faith journey, but for those of us who are and who have a committed relationship with Jesus Christ, the interesting thing is we hang out with the miracle worker every day. We sing his songs, we praise him, we worship him, but when a miracle is needed, what surfaces first is how and not faith. How? Hebrews chapter 11 is a record of the Hall of Fame believers, and it lists several of them. And in each instance, these believers are described with uh, uh, this phrase, by faith. And here are some of their names, by faith Abel, by faith Enoch, by faith Noah, by faith Abraham, by faith Isaac, by faith Jacob. These were people who overcame the how question with faith and began to believe God. Why is, do we struggle? Why can't we trust him? Why can't we believe him? Why do we always end up asking the how question when we are in need of the miraculous in our own lives? And the answer, of course, is in this story, and that is that we were all born blind. We're all born blind. And we can't see the way God sees. God sees the past, he sees the present, he sees the future, and, and that blindness often surfaces in the question of how. And like the man in the story, uh, we are blind, not, not physically in that sense, but spiritually blind, and we don't see clearly what's going on, and the enemy brings doubt around and, and begins to, you know, even though we know the miracle worker, we are a miracle because of the miracle worker, he, sin, he, he tends to push that question to the surface for us. How, God, can this be? And in this story, we get a, a close-up view of what blind people do in the presence of a miracle and a miracle worker. And it's very, very interesting how this story starts off, and it's significant for us to understand, because the first kind of blindness that we struggle with is, is clearly right here happening in the people who are following the miracle worker around, who are disciples of the miracle worker. And you see it immediately, don't you? It says, now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. 
Jesus saw a man who was blind. But his disciples saw something else. They asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? Who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Theological blindness is so damaging to our walk with the miracle worker. When we are theologically blind and we buy into something that has been going on for generations and, and for, for all of history in terms of equating with God, and we buy it, and the enemy is selling it, it's very destructive to our lives and our hearts. And, and here it is. A common belief is, and it ha was in the past, in the time in which they lived, and it's endured to today, and that is that God punishes sinful people in obvious ways. This guy's not blind because, you know, there was, there was some kind of a, you know, ha something that happened at birth that, that caused blindness or, or just, just the fact that he's, he's uh, you know, was, is, is handicapped because of, of what happened. And there's the explanation has to be that he sinned. He did something wrong. He did something that displeased God. And so even maybe in the womb, God said, you know, you were going to see, but your mom was wicked and, and your dad was wicked. And so now you can't see. And listen to me this morning. We, we are buying into this every day of our life that God punishes people in obvious ways. Bad karma, sickness, physical handicaps, singleness, loss of employment, a flat tire, <laughs> obesity, death of a loved one, childless couples. I mean, it's endless what we buy that the enemy is selling about uh, the reason that these things are happening in our lives. Because we must have sinned somewhere. Because we must have done something wrong. And God is displeased. And it's, it's the enemy's attempt to separate us from the miracle worker, to separate us from our miracle, to separate us from the God who loves us and cares about us. He has to put a wedge in and say, you know, the reason things aren't working out in your life is because you have displeased God. You have done something that has made God unhappy. And since you made God unhappy, he's going to make it miserable for you. And so all of these things that are happening in a row, sequential things, great crises, all of this stuff is because you're not a good person. You're, you're a, a sinful person, and so God is getting even with you. And yet the Bible is crystal clear for us on what the penalty for sin is. The penalty for sin is eternal death or eternal separation from God. It's not a flat tire. It's not the loss of a loved one. It's not uh, you know, obesity. It's not uh, physical handicaps of any kind. The Bible is clear. It tells us it, it, many times, but Romans 6 and 23 is one example. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. He's saying, listen, the punishment for ultimate sin, the reason I don't want you to live a life of sin is because you're going to be eternally separated from God. Not that you're going to limp around. I mean, there are consequences of sinful behavior. And, and that's, that's different from what we're talking about right here. There, there are consequences of me living in, in a sinful way, living my life reckless. I can wind up wrecking my life, wrecking my body physically, and walking around with a limp or a broken arm or whatever else as a result of, uh, of living in a sinful manner. But that's not God punishing me because of my sin. That is my choices determining a destiny for me that God doesn't want. Choose life, he said from the beginning. I said before you, life and death, choose life. This is the one I want you to go down. Here's what I have for you. Here are the blessings that I want to bestow upon you. If you'll walk in the pathway of obedience and follow me after me. Don't choose this. This can be destructive and harmful to your life. But it's not God pitching spears at us as we walk away from him and punishing us and lightning bolts and you know, trying to, to in some way you know, uh, get even with us because, man, we, we are just not living right. The Bible clearly tells us Jesus corrected this misguided, uh, dogmatic kind of theology. What is a, 
a dogma or a dogmatic theology. It's a, a settled or established opinion. There's no room for any truth to creep in. We have settled it. This is the way it is. This is the way it's always been. You know, God punishes. You know, the Greeks even believed this, that there were the, the gods were up there and uh, they were displeased with humanity and, and ever so often they would just do stuff to trip them and make them fall and bust their chin open or something. You know, they just were not happy with them. And, and this is the way they displayed their unhappiness. We're going to punish you. You know, you're going to, you know, you're going to have sick children. You're going to have, you know, all of these kinds of things. And this had, this, this, this lie had begun to grow and be steeped, even in those that are hanging out with the miracle worker. They've seen what God has done. And the first question out of their mouth is, who sinned? Jesus sees a blind man. They see, who sinned? And, and it's so, so damaging to us to live in this kind of a thought. Jesus set his attention on mission. Mission of God would not be disrupted by bad, blind, theological uh, thinking. He said, listen, I must work the works of him who sent me. While it is day, for night is coming, no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Dogmatic theology absent the person and the work of Jesus Christ is the enemy of mission. It, is, it brings up the how question and, uh, you, know, the, this, the, the, you know, there's really probably no possibility unless God just somehow decides to forgive you of your sins. You are the way you are because you have sinned and, and God's punishing you. And so if you want to get out of that kind of uh, sinful behavior, you just have to plead with God and, and maybe somehow he'll decide to relent. You're still probably going to be blind, but at least you'll get to go to church. You're still going to be lame, but you know we'll push you in a wheelchair and you can sit near the front. You know? You're still going to be troubled in your mind, but you know, at least you'll have a few friends. All right? It's, it's, it's so damaging what the enemy does. They, they, it kills mission in favor of an argument. And Jesus highlights the window of mission for each of our lives as very, very short. I must work the works of him who sent me, for night is coming and no one can work. You have to listen and be on mission with me because you're not going to be here forever. You are not going to be here forever. You're not promised every single day forever. You have a limited window of time on planet Earth. You must work mission. You must do what I've called you to do in that season. We have no time to waste. Life is so fleeting. And the mission is setting in front of us. And then the question comes like, what is my mission? And it's told to us in this story too. God, what is my mission? Your mission is to tell your story. Your mission is to tell your story. Therefore, the neighbors of those who had previously had seen the blind man said, Is this he who sat and begged? And someone said, Hey, this is he. And others said, He is like him. And he said, I am he. And therefore they said to him, How were your eyes opened? That is our mission in life, is to tell our story. You have enough theology to get started if you know your story. If you know that you were blind and now you can see. If you know how God has transformed you. Patty had a tremendous story. God transformed her. And that story, not only did she, did she you know, tell it, every opportunity she had, her face was a glow, and people saw it as we walked up and down the hallways. And the, that hatred, that victimization, all of that was replaced with a sense of love and compassion and willingness to serve and help other people out. It was amazing how God transformed her life. She was telling her story every single day, and that was enough for many people to come and, and, and get to know the same Jesus that she knew personally. I am He. Your primary mission is, is to stand up in public and say, I am he, I am she, who has been changed by the power of Jesus Christ. I have been transformed. I am a story of what the miracle worker can do. 
A man called Jesus, uh, he, he was telling them how it happened. A man called Jesus made clay, he anointed my eyes, and he said to me, go to the pool of Salaam and wash. And so I went and washed and I received sight. Your story is you were blind and now you see. You received sight. You have been transformed and changed by the power of God. And it is a life-changing story for everybody who listens to it. People are curious about you as you are living in your faith for Christ. They see you react differently to all kinds of things that happen around you. And they are curious as to why. What is your story? The least theological question that they ask the blind man once he was healed. Then they said to him, where is he? This is an interesting question that they're asking and one that he didn't immediately understand. He saw the literal ramifications of it. Where is he? I don't know. You know, he was, he was right over there. Now, you know, the crowd left and he, they followed him and I, I, I don't really know. You know, it might be in the next marketplace or wherever. He literally was answering the question. But there's two aspects to the questions that are being asked of us about where Jesus is. The first aspect is literal. Where is he? I, I just want to see him and, and, and I, want to, I want some inspection. I want to inspect what's going on. He, he abides for us. We tell them he abides in the presence of his people. Come with me to church and, and you can check it out. And that's, that's one of those things where people come and they're just kind of inspecting. They don't want to make any commitments yet. They're just kind of inspecting. Let's see if there's some more stories, okay? And uh, some more success stories. I know your story. That's pretty cool. It's pretty awesome. Let's see about some of the rest of this and check it out. And so they don't always sit in the middle or the front. They're sometimes sitting in the back and they're observing and watching everything that's going on. And uh, over time, they're, they're inspecting. So the first part of that question is just, you know, where is Jesus? I want to inspect. I want to see if what you're saying is really true. I want to see if he's really the miracle worker, if he's really able to do things. I have some pretty impossible things I can't really believe for. I want to do some inspection. I want to find out what's going on. But the second part of this is spiritual, spiritually. Where is he for my life change? And that has to do with, with surrender. I'm ready to make a change. Now listen, I can, I, can, I can give you a very practical instance of this. I have a very good friend, a pastor friend, that I have known you know, virtually my whole life in ministry. And he lost 88 pounds in eight months. Believe me, I wanted to know what was going on. But I wasn't just asking, I'd already done the inspection, right? I was asking the life change question. I want to do what you're doing because I'm seeing the life change in you. There are people who are watching you and the spiritual transformation that's taking place in your life. They're ready to cross the line. They're ready to make that spiritual commitment. So that question for them is not like uh, orientation. You know, we all come together in the church and you can inspect him. So that question is like, right now, I'm ready to cross the line. How do I do it? Where do I sign on the dotted line? How do I get in to, to faith? How do I get into this commitment, into this relationship? I am so sick and tired of the way my life has been going. I am ready to commit. I am ready to surrender. How does it happen? And that's us being able to walk them through, well... I don't know all the details, but here's what I did. I just surrendered to him and said, I want you to be the Lord and the leader of my life. And I am committing to obey you and to follow you. And I'm going to follow the Christian community. I'm going to be engaged in church and, and on a faithful basis. And, and I'm going to let you cut the rough edges off of me. You know, when we come together, it's, it's not always in, in this room this morning. It's, it's not comfortable for everyone. Everyone's not getting the same thing as, as, as someone else may be getting. Because sometimes God is, is bringing us to community to kind of knock the rough edges off. I've sat through plenty of those kinds of situations over my life growing up in Him, growing up in Christ, where, you know, uh, I was being challenged to, to 
uh, let God smooth me out with the people that he had brought me together with. Let God rub some of the rough edges off of my life so that I could take next steps and do the next thing. And it was no fun. I had a, I had a friend when we were, uh, when I was like in, in sixth and seventh grade, his dad owned a gym shop. Uh, not, not like, you know, nothing like you're thinking in your mind right now. This was a rock place. <laughs> You open the door of it, and there was just rocks everywhere, you know. It was called the gem store. And uh, we would go inside and and, and ugly rocks and stuff like that. But his dad had these big tumblers. And we would make our way back to the back where these tumblers were. And they were breaking the rough edges off of rocks. And I'm sure these rocks were not very happy. Ouch, ouch, don't like it. And they were just being tumbled around. And he would show us some that he had polished clean, And they were beautiful, they were purple, and they were onyx, and and all kinds of beautiful, beautiful stones that were ugly in the front of his shop that had been polished down and made beautiful. And God is doing that work in all of us, and he does it in community. He does it in community. You know, it's impossible for us to try to make that happen on our own, all right? Because we're not gonna do things that upset us, right? I try not to upset myself as much as possible. I get into as few arguments with myself as I can, but believe me, in the community of faith, <laughs> my blood pressure has gone up sometimes. Uh, my, you know, uh, the difficulties and the challenges that, that we face in community all the time, at all different kinds of levels, breaking off parts of me and making me a lot more humble. Yeah. Listen, when I started out as a youth pastor, uh, I was loaded for bear, man. I'd come out of Bible school, and uh, I was going to change the planet, right? And you guys just shut up and listen, because I just, uh, I've got God's counsel, you know? And I got humbled in so many ways. You know, I, uh, I was just broken by my kids and the things that they would do. Uh, Pastor Friend and I were talking about this the other day, and I was like, we were in a really rough part of town. And I said, you used to, like, load your kids up on a bus and take them to camp? You know, I had to do a shakedown before we went to camp. Like, you know, I, I had to take the cocaine away, and I had to take the, the marijuana away, and the alcohol. That is not 7-Up. Give that to me right now. And, uh, you know, I had to take all of this stuff away from my kids. And I had, like, a trash can full of, of illegal things before we left to go to, to, to Christian camp. Just full. And, I, and I'm sitting here, yeah, I'm real successful. <laughs> I'm a great. I am great. Uh, I said early on when we first started and we were starting to grow, you know, we had we had like uh, we started out with only about four or five kids, you know, coming regularly. But at this point, we have like 15 to 20 kids coming, you know, and I thought it would be cool, like to have a break like you do, you know, in the movies, like they would show part of the movie and then and then you have this intermission and we would take this break and then, you know, we would come back. And so they could go out and play volleyball and they could do all this stuff. And, and meanwhile, we would be setting up the snack bar and doing all kinds of productive things inside to get ready for the next phase of what we were going to do. Huge mistake. I went outside to find them. They were gone. They were gone, man. <laughs> Smoking, you know, in the park. And, and these guys are down here, you know, buying, uh, you know, paraphernalia and, and stuff. And... Uh, meeting friends, you know, that they had called on the church phone and, you know, uh, out of those 13-year-old girls meeting these friends who are, you know, l- drinking in the car. And, uh, you know, I just, I, I can't do it. We can't even have a break, you know. So it, it humbled me. I started thinking, I don't know anything about ministry, God. I'm a complete failure. Can you help me? And God says, I am helping you. I'm just breaking off some of those rough edges on you so that you can be more compassionate. And the story turns. You know, over the next three or four years, I gain their trust. I am able to go to their schools. We see a great revival. We see neat things starting to happen in their hearts and lives. And their parents trust me. Their parents trust me. And start believing, you know, in the program and in what we're trying to accomplish. And it's so incredible what God does when we let him break us down. But I came in knowing everything, <laughs> and God humbled me to where I knew nothing. Uh, people want to know your 
where your life change came from. John chapter 1, uh, verse 46, Philip has been telling Nathaniel about Jesus. And, you know, he's, it's, it's sickening. It's, it's, it's like a, some kind of an MLM pitch to him. You know, he's like, I've heard all this, you know, like from other people, how great things can work if you follow this path and do that and whatever. And so he finally, he's frustrated and he says, can anything good, because he knows that this Jesus that Philip is talking about is from Nazareth. And so he says, can anything good come from Nazareth? Philip sees his opening and his opportunity. He says, come and see. Come and see. And that's a part of what we're doing with people all around us, is we're inviting them to come and see. I want to invite our worship team to come back. And ask you this morning, seriously, what are your blind spots? What are you blind to this morning that you need to be able to see? Where do we need to allow God to open our eyes? Have you bought into the difficulties and challenges that are happening in your life are because God is somehow displeased with you? Or somehow you've fallen out of favor with him and so he's just kind of like um, making sure that you understand that He's displeased, and so he's, he's doing things. Are you buying that? Are you buying anything else that the enemy is selling that theologically is so destructive to your life? Are you buying it? Because it brings up, in the presence of the miracle worker, how? It's impossible. All this stuff is, just can't be done. And we're standing with the one who nothing is impossible with. And he says, yes, it can. It can be accomplished. I need you to trust me and believe me that I have always wanted the very best for you. That I set before you life and death. I want you down the pathway of life. I want you in obedience. I want you to be uh, in, in community with us together, worshiping and loving God. I want you to be encouraged in me. I want you to see how much I care about you and how much I love you. Do you believe that your crisis or the crisis of someone else is experiencing God made that to happen? We were talking on first Wednesday and one person was really honest and said, I watched my dad suffer for several years and then die. And it affected my faith. And I started, you know, I I was angry at God. I I drifted away. And maybe that's where you are today is you're a little angry at God because some things have happened. And this, this lie from the enemy has kind of been perpetrated in you. And you're like, God must have been punishing that person. He must have been punishing me, everybody that's around them because he must have been displeased with us. It's a lie from the enemy. And it's meant for your destruction. But have you considered for a moment how God wants to be revealed through you and through the world around you and through your current circumstances? And as Christians, we look at things completely differently because we're not just looking at this moment in this life, but we're thinking in terms of eternity. What we have here is very small, but what we have in eternity is endless. And we're going to be reunited and we're going to be put together. We talked last week about justice and fairness. And, um, you know, there are things we're talking about here. I was meeting with our MIT team and I was like, it's so important that we we come together faithfully. There are things we discuss here that are life changing, life changing. If you grab hold of them, you start living life completely different. If you want to buy into what the world says about justice and fairness, then you have been, you know, you have been disadvantaged. Disadvantaged because of race, disadvantaged because of income, disadvantaged because of of, of intellect, disadvantaged in in so many areas. And so therefore you're a victim. You have no responsibility really over what is happening in your life, that society must build this huge net and catch you and bring you back to equal with everyone else. Or have you thought about this? Was it just and was it fair for Jesus to die on the cross for your sin? Your sin, not his. Was that just? Was that fair? Might there be another way for us to see justice and fairness? Maybe through the eyes of God and not through the eyes of man. Maybe we're not victims. 
Maybe we're all children of God that he loves and cares about. Maybe he has a plan for every one of us that's as beautiful and as unique as somebody else that we've been comparing ourselves to and thinking about. But we can't, be, we can't live our life watching theirs. And so we're so caught up in what we don't have, which was the trap from the beginning in the Garden of Eden when, when uh, you know, they, Adam and Eve are being tempted by the serpent. And they have every tree in that garden. Think of it. Tens of thousands of them that are bearing fruit. God says, they're all yours. Take them day, night, whatever you want. They belong to you. Care for them. Watch over the garden. And there's one tree that God said, that belongs to me. And that's the one the enemy gets them to focus on. Are you kidding me? You talk about not being able to see the forest for the trees. Are you kidding me that, that there's one tree in the midst of tens of thousands that you're fixed on because God says that's mine. And the enemy says that's not fair. You know, that's the one you should have. And we buy into it. Is there a different way of looking at justice and fairness than what the world is perpetuating, what the enemy is trying to get us to do? And listen, is there a different way to look at your life right now and circumstances and things that are going on than to think, God's angry with me. I must have sinned. Something bad happened. Maybe it was my parents. I was set up, you know, to, for destruction from the beginning. You know, they made bad decisions and choices. And so I'm on a place where, you know, that's just the way my life is going to be. Patty put her foot in the ground and said, my generations of people who've lived this way, my dad's in prison, uh, my cousins and sister and brother have gone in and out of jail, and I'm heading down the same pathway, but I'm stopping it in the name of Jesus. I'm going to hold on to the miracle worker and see life change. Will you stand with me? And if you are in a place where you want us to agree with you today that spiritual blindness will be lifted and you'll see clearly. And I want to open these altars to you. Just come. Let's spend some time in the presence of the Lord asking Him to give us clear vision that we might see 